practice it in a way too. Like I always think about my mother. Like she doesn't. I sent her my. She doesn't even understand what's happening with my show. Right. But like she sees it on Instagram and likes it. And it so for becomes me, that's real. better than yeah. nothing. Yeah. Right. Like and that's happening around the world. I'm R J Supa and uh, I make performance. Um, I, paintings, I guess I struggle with that. I say I use paint, but I'm getting better at it. And uh, sculpture, um, sort of, um, I'm interested in the idea of, I, I don't think my work would actually exist without um, people interacting with it in some way. So all the performance I've sort of built is dependent on an audience, but also as a way to sort of keep it a, me at a distance from them, I think. And then uh, the sculpture is usually mirror-based. So again, so an audience sort of has to see themselves in it. And then I've sort of expanded that idea of a mirror into paintings and drawings. And so sort of replicating found objects, ephemera, found photographs, my own personal history and um, yeah, that's sort of the basis of my practice right now. Uh, my name is Jeremy Johnston. I'm the principal of Darling Green. Uh, Darling Green is a collaborative curatorial and uh, design practice that focuses on uh, services for art institutions and galleries and collectors. Um, so we sort of combine curatorial projects with exhibition and graphic design projects and look for meaning between the two. Um, we also uh, help private and corporate art collections with uh, collections management and uh, acquisitions, valuation, insurance, transport. Um, we sort of function as a freestanding, for arts institutions we can function as a freestanding exhibitions unit where we can help staffs um, expand their exhibition program without um, expanding their entire institution. And also for art collections, we sort of can umbrella all of the services necessary for an art collector to manage their collection. Um, and it's inherently intersubjective. It's inherently collaborative. Uh, and I think we operate under the name Darling Green because it, it sort of is a collective uh, of a wide variety of people that come together based on the needs of a certain project. So there's, there is individual agency, but it's all happening under the umbrella of this sort of studio persona. Um, and that's very important to us. It's important to me that there's not this sort of um, strident self, uh, you know, um, driven activity within the, the discussion. Everything is collaborative um, and um, generative based on the group of people in the room. And I think that has an effect on, on the projects that we, that we help with and the artworks that we help with. My name is uh, Jonathan Sims. Um, I'm kind of been in, my own personal practice has been in transition for the last few years. I began as a, a geometric abstract painter and that because concepts of non-objectivity and non-representational work has survived, but I've been searching through a lot of different new media to try and find different ways to capture a lot of the basic concepts that I find are inherently interesting about abstraction. Um, the last three years I've been spending a lot of time building these projection installations primarily, but also been working in print and other forms as well. And a lot of this is, is kind of an attempt to use the new media, the, the, the excitement and technology of projection and, and technology like that to connect back to the, the abstraction that has characterized so much of human art for the last few thousand years. And in trying to create this kind of through line between today's work and to create a familiarity and a sense of understanding within the viewer, uh, I draw upon many, many different varieties of sources, um, some ancient, some contemporary, to kind of distill them through this lens of, of abstraction uh, to make something that feels immediate and fresh and part of this, this kind of sci-fi future that we're all living in, but also has this familiarity and understanding of 
the pre-industrial world that connects it through the post-industrial world and into whatever future we're, we're moving into. Um, a, lot of this, a lot of this began as kind of an exploration of how the viewer actually interprets abstraction and how the, the viewer interprets things that are in, inherently non-objective and don't necessarily have any connection to the real world. And by using a lot of ancient forms, a lot of sculptural forms that have this universality between them, and a lot of um, graphic design principles that relate back especially to language and other things and forms like that, uh, I think it kind of gives the ability to step into the projection spaces, to step into the, to the work that I'm producing, and capture the sense of immediacy and familiarity that, we, familiarity that we have with our understanding of language and symbols, but then also has that sense of distance and uh, otherness that exists within this technological world that we live in, too. And the, the audience and the viewer themselves is, becomes a primary focus of how that, that interaction actually happens and where the the actual moment of, of art and like meaning occurs is within that, that, that space. Hi, I'm Jean Wilkinson and um, I basically began my art practice as a painter, uh, abstract expressionist, and in the, in, during that time period my, my practice was very internal and private, um, studio based. I would spend hours with my paintings alone and it became um, a kind of almost spiritual experience. People talk about that sometimes with abstract expressionism, you know, when Jackson Pollock said, you know, I am nature, which is maybe a little grandiose, but I kind of understood what he meant when he said that. Um, as time went by, um, that personal relationship, I, I still have a personal relationship with my work, but it's also begun to expand out into the world much, much more than, than when I was doing that kind of painting. I was kind of forced into making changes. Um, not by any desire necessarily, but by external and internal circumstances like, for instance, becoming um, physically sensitive to the, the oil paint and the solvents that I was using. So I had to quit using oil paint, began using acrylic, um, which changed, changed everything. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm obviously very sensitive to the material I'm using and acrylic had such a different feel that I began to uh, work in, in um, new ways with it. I, I would, would make it, turn it into liquid and do stains and uh, used many layers. My work's always been about layering, um, multi-layers. Even when I was doing abstract expressionism, the, the surfaces were dozens of layers, you know, sort of ravaged and torn and put paint put back. and. Um, then I began to do it more literally with layers of fabric and uh, using um, objects interspersed between the layers. Um, I think when I really kind of began to expand out of my insular practice was a trip I took in 2006 with my son Andrew who's a photographer and I had worked my way into assemblages by that time where I was sort of taking everything from my studio and putting it together into pieces. Because of my up and down relationship with galleries, I had been, been sadly rejected and, and felt so badly about this, this gallery that I wasn't working out that, that I, instead of ordering new stretchers and doing large paintings, I said, I'm just gonna take everything in the studio and just use it and not bring anything new in. So anyways, in the meantime, some Barbie dolls came, came in the studio, um, just got there somehow, traveled in, 
and I, uh, uh, I, I decided they were, you know, part of my medium. I gessoed them white, and I drip painted them like um, Pollock with red, blue, and yellow, like Mondrian, sort of a nod to my, my abstract uh, roots. And they became the painted people, and they, they have companion animals who uh, travel um, here and beyond. The first trip was that one with my son from Denver to California, and he said, bring them along. So it became their, their trip. We, we choreographed um, various adventures in the wilderness with them. And, and from that time on, um, I guess I, I've been more involved with work that, that reaches out into the world to the point where I'm now doing um, video installations and uh, um, work with scrims and true projectors where it becomes a kind of performance piece where instead of painting, um, literally I'm painting with color and light. Two image streams interact in the center and then people walk between the scrims in what I call my cloud tunnel and uh, they, they dance and I photograph that. So it's again layers upon layers upon layers. So that's sort of been the evolution I guess as far as the word intersubjectivity goes. I'm more and more that as I, as I move along in my, my art career. Did you and your son, when you were bringing the Barbies around, did he photograph them as well? He did. So it became like a collaborative? Yes, it was a collaborative venture, and that was really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, and in fact, after that trip, uh, I wanted to mess around with the photographs, but it, they were his, basically. So I, I instead, that was when I started using Photoshop. And from that time on, I was like, oh, this is, this is what I'm doing. I'm on the computer now, you know, forever. Um, and... Uh, so I started to, uh, to make virtual journeys, not real journeys, but virtual journeys of the painted people, which is, they go on, you know, everywhere in the universe now. And do you have the same, the same painted people, the original painted people are in your studio, and then do you keep adding characters? Yes, or, yeah. there's so about the universe like sort of 40 of them now, with children wow. and teenagers and all these animals. And, and so it includes a kind of narrative that evolves almost in and out of your control. Yes. Yeah, they have their own lives. Yeah. And is it all digital now? Or do you have the physical objects and then they enter into like a digital realm? Well, I photograph them. Right. You know, and so it's, it's I mean, they, they, I guess they could be called sculpture or installation, but, you know, mostly I, as far as my art goes, there's photographs of them that I integrate. Sometimes I use my former abstract paintings as elements in my digital collages. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all you know mixed together now. But the prevalence of phones that we have, the prevalence of cameras that give us the ability to capture things and have them and then transmit them has changed our brains so much about the way that we perceive photography and the way we perceive the experiences that we're having that those 
photographs that are now being shared on Instagram, that are being shared on the internet, they, they feel like the complete piece in a way that doesn't necessarily feel that way in the actual installation. I don't know. It's it, a lot of my work I've been, well, sort of recent work in the past two years has been like, I think like most artists, we just collect, I have like, you know, show cards from every show I've been to, or, you know, even press, I have stacks of press releases. I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? And then I started thinking about photographs because of Instagram or the thousands of photographs that are on my phone that I never look at, that I forget about. And then I started going to like junk shops and thrift stores and buying up other people's physical photographs and then recreating them exactly as they are, same size, but like recreating the object and not the image. Um, and it's, I, I don't, it's so interesting because I think that there's, there is this sort of like shared history with social media, but then there's so much that just gets tossed away, like whether it's digital or analog. And it becomes this, I remember years and years ago, there was this picture in a thrift store that I bought like an eight by 10 of like a mom and her two daughters. And I got like sort of not like overly emotional, but I was like, did they die? Like what happened to them? Why would you put this in a thrift store? It's, I'm like interested in going back to this analog thing and sort of hopefully I, I, like uh, I guess like increasing the value not monetarily but sort of like emotionally that you would want to hang on to a picture of like your mother or your brother or whatever it is um, so that there's this sort of I guess like legacy I think of that and for me the only emotional attachment became through like a recreation of the object I think our the way we experience things has profoundly changed I think if you look if you look at objects and exhibitions, you could see maybe in the 70s or 60s, a kind of really object-based model where museum shows were almost representing individuals' collections with individual objects. And you go in to, to learn something, it's like a transmission, um, almost like a one-way transmission pedagogical sort of experience. Whereas now I think people sort of more casually move through, they pass through experiences. And taking pictures is more like bookmarking. You don't, it's not a sense of owning something or possessing. Huh. It's more of a sense of just, you know, passing by. Huh. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, do, if you're passing by an object, is that, does the object have the arresting power that it, that it, you know, that potential for arresting power that it did 50 years ago? Does a painting huh. really, you know, are we even experiencing reality that way? You know, or is reality like an image, like a cinema, cinematized well, narrative? It feels like the capture of that too isn't even for yourself, it's for the audience. It's like, oh, I was at the Louvre, here you can see it. Yeah. But you can't even get close to the Mona Lisa now, you know, but, I, but you like see it, you see people, like you see people seeing other people seeing the Mona Lisa yeah. because it's just like throngs of people and like, how, I, I watch on Instagram, people are like, whatever, it was like a Beyonce concert and everybody I knew was there. And I was like, did you even watch the concert? Because I'm watching you watch it through Instagram. <laughs> like, how is anybody enjoying it when you're holding your phone? But I also don't want to complain about that because that's just the state of the world. So I'm trying to figure out how to marry that with like actual experience. In my experience um, with technology, it's it's freed me up to create a lot more than I would have otherwise, simply because the the real object takes up so much space. Right. I love paintings. I you know think they are just sublime experiences, but. I can do so much more, you know, and just store it on a on a hard drive or you know something, and and it's not in my way. I mean, I'm now thinking of all my former work as, as sort of a storage problem rather than a you know a, a wonderful body of work, which is sad for me because I love it, but I've been sort of just dispersing it into the world. The computer has freed me up to expand my, my practice in amazing ways. I don't know if, it, you know, and also to share it, you know, like on, I don't know if everyone else shares your work on, you know, Facebook and Instagram. You mentioned Instagram. And One of the things that has struck me recently 
I imagined that the internet was going to be the big thing that changed the world. And then I thought that, you know, when iPhones came along in 2009 and the smartphones came along, that the access to the internet and this constant connectivity was going to change everything. And now I think that it's the cameras that are on those phones that have changed more than anything else. The ability to capture things constantly and the ability to share them, and that's part of it, but the, the ability to, to swallow up our experience and keep a collection of 30, 40, 50, or if you're on vacation, 2,000 photos a day of whatever you're experiencing, and then just store it away in a hard drive. And I have hard drives now that collect my MP3 collection that I started you know, 15 years ago. Like, I'm never gonna revisit it, but it's there and I have it. And it's always gonna be like, uh, it's really changed the value of all of these different media and these different things and really changed my relationship to the object too. Yeah, I just, I, I wonder what, to me, I mean, I don't know because I don't know how to even, you know, scan photographs and put them into a digital file or something. Um, but like, I think that's right. No one's gonna look at those too. It's like this almost like safety, well, at least they're there that I know in case of blank that I have them. And it's like, you're, you're gonna forget. It's to me, it's a similar thing of putting them in a thrift store. But it, I mean, it must feel good in some way to say like, oh, I can digitize things. Or I remember when like, you know, people were switching over their VHS to DVDs and then DVDs into, you know, digital files. And I'm, I, always, I actually always, I just watched something where, um, oh, it was this, sh whatever, it doesn't matter. But someone like found their wedding DVD. And I was like, how many times do you watch your own wedding? And the couple said, we watched it on our first anniversary and then it was in the garage for the rest of our lives, you know? And I, I think about those things a lot because th there was an intention in the beginning with capturing these things and then it just kind of goes away ultimately. I mean, even on, in a digital sphere, you know, you, you go down your Instagram feed. Like, I don't look at my first Instagram post from five years ago or whenever I started using it. Neither does anyone else. Well, it's weird when that one person goes down and clicks like on right. the first <laughs> one. Right, it is weird. There's always that one random person. You're yeah. Like, Who are you? Right. Why, why did you do that? It's funny. It reminds me of, uh, you know, like books, libraries of books or books that we have at home. There's I think Umberto Eco, you know, somebody asked him if he had read all of the books on his in his office. And he laughed and said, no, no way, I haven't even read 10%. But they embody this beautiful potential. Like, think about all of the energy and knowledge that's there. And somehow maybe all these digital files are similar. Like, even though you don't return to these photos, the knowledge that you have, all of this kind of history and, and, and uh, meaning just on your body physically all the time is kind of powerful. Yeah, and the, the sense of value that we bring to it individually, I mean, like zooming out and looking and thinking, I mean, a hundred years ago, humanity, in the, especially in, the, like, in technological countries, was already producing massive amounts more data than any individual could ever possibly consume. Um, and that was a hundred years ago. And now we have all of these different things that we're just producing and producing and producing and creating this m mounds of it. And part of me thinks it's natural that we're spending so much time working with like artificial intelligence to try and just manage that huge amount of data that exists about each of, each of us individually. It's, it just seems like... Is anyone here afraid of like technology sort of encroaching on your lives in ways that, you know, there's all this conversation about the Alexas of the world, like picking up what we're hearing are our phones, which I certainly think they do, because as soon as I mention something, I'm getting an ad for it on Instagram. Um, do you have like fears of technology sort of encroaching in without your permission? I think so. I mean, I think it's inevitable that it's going to get more and more clever, and no, no one's stopping it from happening. So, I mean, it seems to be um, almost inevitable. I think we have to. Um, figure out how to live with that sort of thing. Um, you know, have more transparency. Mm -hmm. That's what they're always talking about, transparency, you know? I'm a little worried about Big Brother, for sure, mm -hmm. but I think I'm personally more worried about the way that my, the way that I've begun to interact with um, my own artwork or my other people in my lives has already been massively influenced by 
Facebook and Instagram um, and other social media or other formats as well. The the systems of like Pavlovian, <laughs> um, like B.F. Skinner uh, reinforcement techniques that are being used to addict us to these things. Mm -hmm. And w you talked about passing by, passing through, and like you talked about like a Beyonce concert. A lot of that it comes from the fact that these companies have created systems that, that reward us for producing content for another company so that they can then generate ad revenue and so on. Yeah, yeah. And one of my concerns too, especially with like installation, is like making photographs. I've got this photograph and I'm sharing it on Instagram and it starts to become a major part of what I'm doing and that photograph becomes the piece itself and in my interaction with others. But then I've started to realize more and more that I'm doing that because, again, I'm benefiting these, these different companies that want my content to produce out there so other people can see it too. And I think I'm more concerned about the um, I'm more concerned about the way that I'm inter like interacting with my art and other individuals um, just on a day-to-day -day level because of my interaction with technology. I think, I think it's interesting that, you, you know, the, what I worry about it is the, the illusion that we're working outside of the master narrative, that somehow your work is so distanced from the major economy that you're not, um, you're not being manipulated by that economy. And I think the arts, you know, I think that the upside of intersubjectivity or the upside of participation is a more democratic and open and collaborative set of, of, of terms and relationships. The downside is this kind of like hyper subjectivity where opinion is substituted for, uh, for fact, where, um, where the master kind of culture, the dominant culture, drives every decision in our lives via some surrogate process. Mm -hmm. um, and that your sense of being a subjective or an independent agent is actually an illusion um, that's fed to you by the control surface. You know? um, so the question within the arts of how we preserve that true intersubjectivity is, is something for a wider discussion.